So, Trish, and, what, and, what did you do? Sorry, right. So also important for people that are on the course, because some of you lovely ladies are on the course, is they are reminders. The questions and answers are reminders to us as to why we're doing the course. So between Ryan and I, we'll go through some of the some of the questions and please feel free to, to continue to ask questions as we go along, either as Ryan said, you know, verbally or in the chat. And we will do our best to answer them. So to begin with, Ryan, mm. I think the most asked question I get is why would I choose to do a yoga teacher training course if I don't want to be a teacher? What is the point? Yeah, it is. That's that's the one we get we get a lot. And I think I think people get confused sometimes. They they think that this course is only designed for people who want to go and teach in a studio or a gym, um, and that already in itself brings up a lot of pressure. Uh, because most people, myself included, by the way, when I first did my extra course, did not see myself as going into the role of a teacher. My, my hunger, because where else do we really learn about yoga in depth? We don't learn about the, the behind the scenes magic in the yoga class itself most of the time. And we, you know, sometimes I've got students who've been going to classes in yoga for years and who have never wondered or, or maybe have wondered, but have never felt comfortable to ask, why do you use this word? What does that phrase mean? What is Shavasana? You know, what, why, do we, why do we lie on our back at the end of every class? It's so strange. Why do we do that? Um, why do we do a child's pose so often? What is all going on in these strange breathing techniques? And a lot of people don't feel comfortable to ask that of their teacher, sadly. Um, and then, and then I've also had students over the years say, th there feels like there must be more to this than what I'm seeing. There must be more to this than meets the eye. Um, and, and more than what's just stretching our hamstrings and trying to touch our toes. There feels like there's more here. And there's nowhere else to learn. There really isn't anywhere else to learn. And if you try and pick up a book on yoga without context, it's it's it can be quite overwhelming there's a lot of sanskrit there's a lot of um it's almost like the authors write with this preconceived notion that you should already have a basic vocabulary so the way in which we've kind of put this course together is so that people can go onto the course with either the intention of becoming a teacher or just the intention of learning more about yoga or maybe learning something completely new that is based in health and well-being and just taking tools from it. They might not necessarily be dedicating their whole lives to a yogic path, but they might, and we've had teachers do that. We've had teachers come on the course, certify, graduate as a teacher, and then never step on the mat to teach, but they've used the tools in life coaching, in holistic corporate worlds, um, in children, in schools, and really, that's quite amazing. So, Trish, there are so many reasons you could do the course, um, not just planning to actually teach yoga. Self-development. Exactly. And that's exactly what it does, right? It deepens our understanding of ourselves so, so incredibly and puts us in touch with ourselves and gives us tools to use for the rest of our lives. And t the teachers that are on here that are still in training don't, don't forget those tools, because even if there are moments where you, you don't practice or you don't teach, you still have those tools at your disposal and they are invaluable. And then the other question that I get, second to that is, I would like to do a yoga teacher training course, but I'm not good at yoga. I mean, right, what is not good at yoga? <laughs> I wonder if anyone else who's watching this has ever asked that or said that, right? So the, the, first, the first thing that I always say to that is, uh, really when somebody asks me that question, I know that they're not trained to know what yoga actually is because what they're referring to is asana. 
they are referring to the yoga poses, the physical yoga practice. That's what people refer to in our Western world as yoga. So already there's an opportunity to clear up that space a little bit and understand. And those of you watching who are already enrolled, I want you guys to be able to help people clean up their vocabulary around these questions because you will be asked many of these questions as well. They'll say to you, but why should I do your class? I'm not good at yoga. I'm not flexible. I'm not fit. Uh, I can't touch my toes. I can't do back bends. I can't look like a pretzel. And, um, and that's already a sad stereotype that we have around yoga. And the stereotype in the West is that yoga is for 21-year-old uh, blonde white girls who can fit into uh, beautiful uh, leggings you know that's unfortunately the stereotype we have and we love the 20 year old blonde girls you know good for them but there's a lot more people out there a lot more body types so 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 when people say i'm not good at it they they're referring to the asana and what we want people to understand is that asana is only one eighth of the whole spectrum of yoga, the Ashtangasana, the eight limbs, and the physical postures. We have meditation and pranayama, the breathing work, and we've got mental practices, and we've got spiritual practices, and we've got philosophical study, and we've got self-study and introspection and introflection. In fact, you can be, you can be a highly, highly self-realized yogi without having done any physical asana ever in your life. The physical asana is a conduit into the state that we call yoga. It is a process of getting the body balanced, healthy and strong, so that we can actually pursue higher practices, mental and emotional practices. It's difficult to pursue a personal and spiritual path if your body is sick, and weak and in pain. It's very, it's a hindrance to sit in meditation or to, to practice any kind of self-growth when your body is an incumbent. So the asana is just one aspect. So when people say, I haven't done yoga before, I'm not good at it, I blah, blah, blah. I say to them, that's just the postures and the postures will come in time. And you might never get into a certain pose that doesn't make you a non-accomplished yogi at all. All right, good. So, so the aim of yoga is self-realization. That's what it is. It's not headstands and handstands. Headstands and handstands are one of the tools that we use to feel good about ourselves, to strengthen our body, to have energetic effects on ourselves. But that's not to be all and end all. Okay, so how about... I want to be a yoga teacher, but I want to be a vinyasa yoga teacher. I don't think I want to be an ishta yoga teacher. What is ishta anyway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still wondering. <laughs> uh, I know it's, uh, I know it sounds it sounds so it sounds weird when I say this, but an, an ishta yoga teacher can can really be any kind of yoga teacher they want to be because. The definition of ishta by its very definition of the acronym, ishta itself stands for the integral or the integrative school or system of hatha yoga, tantra, and ayurveda. So we must look at that, the integral or the integrative, that system which integrates various lineages and styles in. Not only that, but it integrates that person's body into a yogic practice it's a marriage and a blend of what the perfect pose could look like in the perfect world and then what your body's variation of a pose can look like and it's an integration or an alchemy of of you with yoga so rather than you trying to fit into the mold of yoga it's taking you and yoga and and finding a synergy an integration that is personal and subjective. It belongs only to you. And that's beautiful because each of our personal and spiritual paths should be different, should be unique. We cannot cookie cutter 
um, every single person's practice. And that's why there are systems in schools that say every single disciple has to do exactly this formula, this exact sequence, this exact practice. It, it doesn't, in our lineage, it doesn't feel right because a 36-year-old triathlete and a 72-year-old woman in a wheelchair, they both need to access a road up the mountain and they need to do it in their way. So that's, the, that's what the I stands for, integration or the integral part. It need, needs to be organic, personal, real, and accessible. Then I think the biggest confusion comes in with Hatha, the Hatha part of Hatha Yoga. And I blame this on the gym culture, the gym consciousness, because on the gym timetables, it says Vinyasa, Hatha, power, you know, there's a million different names. These are very new names. These have, these have only been around for a few years, if not maybe a decade, a little bit more, that have been used in that context. But all classical Indian yoga within the medieval tradition of, of, of Indian Vedantic yoga, what, it's a certain period of time in the evolution of Vedic teachings of yoga because yoga has taken on many hats many forms throughout thousands and thousands of years the practice that we know of today as the physical asana is based on an, an, a medieval form of what we call classical yoga and that is all hatha yoga all of it is hatha yoga if it's got a handstand a down dog a chaturanga a lunge a pigeon or whatever all those names that we hear all the time it's all hatha yoga Hatha yoga does not mean granny yoga. That's what the gym culture has taught people. Hatha yoga is the balancing of polarity within us using physical posture, meditation, pranayama or breathing, Ayurveda, and yoga nidra. That is what Hatha yoga is. It uses these five disciplines, um, and they all fall under the structure of the eight limbs. So, so being a Hatha yoga practitioner, you can practice vinyasa, which just means you're doing the poses woven together without stopping. It's not a whole school. Vinyasa is not a school. It's not a lineage. It is like saying I drive my car um, and stop for half an hour at different lookout points to look at the whales, like yin yoga would do, or I just cruise along all the way to Hermanus, which is vinyasa. Either way, you're still driving your car. You're still taking a journey. That's a terrible analogy, but it's the one I'm sticking with for tonight, and it worked. And, <laughs> and so maybe that brings us a bit back to our, our theme on fluidity that I chatted to you about, because in reality, in real life, if I walk into teacher class now, everyone's going to look at me as a white, older woman. They may assume I'm a Christian, but they're going to put a lot of labels on me. Uh -huh. But actually, I might walk into the class and get a feel that this is going to be a strong vinyasa class because I'm feeling energetic and take everyone by surprise. So... So in reality, the fluidity of what our yoga teacher training course is, is it, it enables all of us to be who we are in reality, rather than label ourselves or our classes. Is that what you're saying, right? That's absolutely what I'm saying, Trish. And, and as soon as I finish this last sentence, I'm going to come to Louis, who has a question. Um, what, what I've loved about being an Ishta teacher over the years is that for the 15 years that I've been teaching full time, every single day, um, I've, I've, I've never felt like I've repeated a class. I've never felt stale. I've never felt bored, not once. And I get bored easily. I've got five planets in Aries. So I get very bored very quickly. Um, but one day I might just feel like this class needs, or maybe I feel I need to just hold static poses and everyone's tired and they've had a long day and it's 36 degrees outside and you just want to hold nice yin space. 
and I am qualified to do that. And then one day I might just feel like, mm, guys, it's spring and the energy needs lifting and winter's been long and you all like feeling a little bit heavy. Let's kick in some vinyasa. Let's do it. And I'm qualified to do that. So being an Ishta teacher is like being given the tools, being given the paintbrush and the palettes. What you put on the canvas, that's up to you. You should feel confident enough um, by the time you certify and of course, after a few weeks and months of just teaching and practice to be able to fly. And that's the truth. Louis, you have a question for us. How are you, Ryan? Sorry, I'm hearing myself on the thing. You good? Um, I'm, I was wondering, just tell us a little bit about the origin of the history. Am I coming through? I'm just coming through to myself. Struggling to hear you a little bit, Louis. Uh, I'm back to you. I think I've got a system. Would you be able to type the question into the chat box? I'll put. Headphone input, external microphone port. That's a, that's a really good one. Hello, you yes. got me now? Yes, much better. Okay, have you got me? Have you got me? Have you got me? Okay, good. Got sorry, you. Technical, technical issues that I'm having here. Sure. Um, no, I was, I was asking where it was, and it's nice to see you. Um, and also just wanted to ask whether you could... Uh, just origins of Esther of specifically, hey? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, very good question. So Esther yoga has a, has a beautiful origin um, story. And it's also the, uh, it's the only system of yoga that can boast that it's proudly South African. Um, Esther yoga was was compiled not invented but the the school and the system that we now know as ishta yoga was compiled by a south african um named kavi yogi raj swarinanda mani finger and mani put this together in the in the 60s and 70s because he had spent his whole life um, from a very young age him and then later on his son alan finger studying under what was really the last generation of classical yoga masters, gurus, teachers, and, and rishis um, in a very, very beautiful period of time that this classical system of yoga was still very pure and being transitioned over into the West. So we see these characters like um, Paramahansa Yogananda, the author of Autobiography of a Yogi, among others, Vivekananda, Swami Shivananda, um, Ayinga himself, and several under Sri Patabi Joyce, several other um, great teachers who we know of as like forefathers of the modern resurgence of yoga in the West. And many studied and trained under these great teachers. And not just like, I'm not talking little yoga teacher training courses here and there. He devoted all periods of his life under the guise and the, the initiation of these masters, these teachers. And so what he did when he ended up coming back to South Africa is he brought all of the teachings together into an integrated system, hence the term integral school of Hatha Yoga. Tantra and Ayurveda, because he didn't only study classical yoga, he also studied to be a tantrika, um, the tantric tradition, and he studied Ayurveda. So he brought it all together. And, and, and our lineage is then passed on in a succession from Mani to Durgana to Marina to myself and to you. So, so he really, it's beautiful how he, how he preserved the teachings of these great masters, many of them who came to stay with him in the ashram in South Africa as well. 
Um, so you can go nice and deep into that in module one on the course and see the origins of it. And his son, Alan, is still alive and teaching today um, as well. I think he's based in LA at the moment in Los Angeles. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. Thank you, Louis. Thank you. And if anyone else has questions, please ask them either in the chat or raise your hands. Talicia. Yes, T. Hi, everyone. Um, I have a question that uh, relates to the, I think it's module two, um, on the nervous system. And uh, not module two, module, module one, lesson two, uh, or day two. Um, and it pertains to obviously delving, first of all, Wow, 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 wow. I'm just so thrilled. I just love this. And oh, it's so, so juicy to just understand the mechanics of our bodies and actually the communication with what I truly believe is like the natural world and nature herself and actually greater intelligence. Um, and I was curious about your thoughts on, because obviously we've got the, the central nervous system, which, which receives information and then it all, you know, is kind of assimilated. But what are your thoughts on, on goosebumps? So sometimes you receive information and it just, and you just like, you're, you almost have an immediate response without even thinking about it. And does that sit in the subconscious mind? Yes. That's a that's such a beautiful question, Silesia. So, so let's let's first look at the physiological component of goosebumps. So, uh, the the yogic teachings state um, that every hair on your body is an extension of the nervous system, which is one of the reasons why yogis in in most systems ended up growing their hair uh, and leaving their hair to grow because it was taught that the longer, and Brendan's smiling because he maybe resonates with the teaching here. Um, so, so I'd love to hear from Brendan on this just now. So the, the, the hair growing out um, is actually strengthening and representing the strengthening of the nervous system and is able to help to absorb more energy from the space around it. And also to like an animal pick up um, the subtle vibrations in the environment around you, like a cat's whiskers do, right? Um, and when a, mm. when a dog, when a dog- That is incredible. Yeah, That's yeah. That's so cool, yeah. <laughs> it really is, it really is. And like a dog's hair on the back of its head stands up when, it's, when it senses something going on, the human hair has the same capacity. Um, and, and traditionally yogis would grow, would actually just allow all the hair in their body to grow because hair is a protection around certain areas of vulnerability. So if we think about hair, it grows in the, the areas that have the most hormonal or lymphatic, um, you know, kind of activity in the body, the pubic region, um, the neck, the throat, the face, the head under the arms and in the, the stomach area and the chest, depending on men and women. And then as hormones change over time, um, that alters in the body of men and women. But the hair is very connected to our physiological response and also to that of our environment. So Brendan, I want you to add something in here before I continue with goosebumps. Tell us about the hair. It's quite, it's quite interesting, Ryan. I think you've, you've, you've summed up pretty much everything. So I'm definitely not shaving my head anytime soon. Um, but you are, yeah, you are right with the, the extension of the hair, almost like branching out branches from your nervous system. Um, I think it was funny because this was discussed when I was a martial arts teacher back in my 20s. This was discussed as well. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of the, also the men that I trained with had long hair. And no one wanted to shave their head for this for that particular reason, um, but I think I, there's nothing more I can actually say about it because I think you've summed up pretty much everything. It, it doesn't it doesn't it make us think of uh, that Samson and Samson and Delilah tale. Yes, I was I was going to mention that the Samson and Delilah tale. You know, like don't shave your, your you you shave your head, you lose your strength, you lose that extension to Mother Nature. You yes. know. 
Yes. But um, it, it is interesting because, uh, you know, honestly, I thought the other day, my, my, I've had long hair for since I left high school. Um, you know, every, everyone knows me with my long ponytail when I walk the streets type of thing. And um, I thought to myself, I need a change. I should shave my head. And then I signed up for the, the Ishta Yoga teacher training. I'm definitely not shaving my head anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long is your hair, Brendan? We haven't. We need to see. <laughs> I can't. I, I don't want to. I look like Tarzan when I wake up in the morning, Trish. That's so, I, yeah. So my hair's pretty wild, but I slick it back in the day. It's just. It's just more manageable when I. Um, when I teach, um, well, or I, we, wear, I have we, the best of both worlds. I put it in a man bun, or I wear it down my back. I've actually recently had it cut. This is strange talking on a yoga teacher training about my hair, but since we brought it up, you know. Well, well, we'll we all look forward to having Tarzan with us on retreat one day. <laughs> yeah. hey, Rana? Definitely. Great. <laughs> so, yeah, I, love, I, love, I love what Brendan's saying here because, um, you know, sometimes the tools that we learn can be applied in different parts of our lives and uh, and so so this the hair is one aspect one component of the nervous system that's a magnificent component but the hair being an extension of of parts of the skin so the the response called goosebumps that happens in the body is is triggered by the autonomic nervous system so the autonomic nervous system is that part of you that happens automatically, yeah? It's like swallowing your saliva, blinking your eyes, um, the breathing response in the body, goosebumps, blushing of the face. My cheeks are going red because I've got a, a light on me and so my cheeks are even going red. I can see them now. Um, the growing of hair, all of this is autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is directly linked to the unconscious mind and the subconscious mind. So what's very fascinating is it doesn't matter how much I sit and consciously try and grow my beard now um, or stop it. <laughs> I might have maybe a little bit of influence on it, but its main function is governed by a much deeper part of my brain. I can, and this is interesting, through yogic practices and martial arts practices and these things, take control over certain functions that would normally be controlled by the sub or unconscious mind, like my breathing. That is one of the reasons why when we practice pranayama, we are prana, energy, yama, control or restriction. We are controlling the movement of energy through the body. So we are taking what would normally be an unconscious or subconscious process and making it conscious. Therefore, we're actually lifting up subconscious and unconscious memories, wisdom and knowledge and bringing it consciously to the surface. Now, when you're in, a, in an environment or a space whereby psychically, intuitively, subtly, that deep part of you is aware of something going on that might be dangerous for you, it will send a response to your physical body so that you can, you've got a language, it's a language, it has to speak to you somehow. So it sends it to your body as a language, heart rate goes up, you get goosebumps, you go cold, you stop, you pause, like an animal does. If you watch a cat, they're extremely perceptive. This is what we call psychic ability, but it's ESP, extrasensory perception. And when, when you hear something that's in alignment with your truth, Tunisia, like you read a quote, or maybe somebody says something that someone was just about to say, this goosebumps goes through the body because there's a, a wise part of you that goes, I recognize that. I register with that. And it's sending you a little message going, yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. That is in alignment. Amazing. So amazing. Hey, oh my word, I can't. This is just too much. <laughs> And I wonder, is it also because um, I know, like, um, you know, firstly, two things with that. In, in Hindu culture, it is said to shave the baby's head the first, after the baby's born, the first um, kind of, to remove the first bit of hair, to kind of take away any uh, past life energy. So it comes, it's probably all linked to that. And then... Um, also, I know, obviously, 
in kundalini yoga there's the wrapping of the hair so is that also then related to then maybe like a preservation of the energy that's exactly what we do that's exactly it and and not only in kundalini yoga but in in many cultures in many parts of the world mm -hmm. um jewish people or Jew, will will cover their head during prayers and meditations um muslims will the sikhs will um many yogic traditions do it as well and and people misunderstand it as a, a shame but it's not it's not it's got nothing to do with shame it's a preservation of energy so it's like a it's like a gentle veiling of yourself to hold the subtle energy in so that you can be more aware of it more sensitive to it and my friend uh one of my kundalini friends and i we experimented with this because trust me we rebelled against turbans for a long time i tried beanies i was wearing a backward cap at one stage <laughs> i would not wear the turban um and then eventually I fell in love with it and I kind of I kind of wear it like Sinbad so I keep like one side down and that's kind of my vibe um but the the difference really came when we were teaching and when I teach without the head covering on my mind is often very much more scattered and this this kind of creates a little bit of a, a focus for my mind and the reason is, is because of the pressure that it places around the 28 platelets of the brain and it kind of holds everything together. So it's just a tool. It's got nothing to do with religion. It's got nothing to do with anything else. It's just another tool. Um, so right, what I, I find on retreat is, you know, in the mornings we get up very early mm. for sadhana and meditation. And we always encourage people to bring a covering for their heads. And by the end of the week, everyone's got their scarves that start off just sort of hanging into a tight turban. Everyone's tying each other's turbans. But what I love about it is that there might be quite a lot of us or a few of us, whatever, however many, it doesn't really matter. But it's early in the morning. You don't want to engage with people. You want to go into the room quiet. And it's so much easier to go and get a cup of tea or to just move around if you are covered. Because then people don't generally chat to you and you know you have your own private space. So you then go into the meditation in private. Whereas if we were all open and free, it would probably be more disturbing, it's probably not the right word to say, but it probably would be a little bit more disturbing mm. instead of just having our own privacy. It does. It definitely feels, I mean, if I'm just taking this, this shawl of mine, you know, if you just sit there just like, like this in meditation, um, you know, and you've got this, you can even see the statues of Mother Mary kind of like that. It's kind of like this, this veil of, of gently like just my little space between the outside world and the inside world. It's like a tea cozy for yogis. <laughs> it just keeps everything brewing underneath nicely. And it's not something that you have to do. It's just something that can feel really nice and, and is good to explore. So those are interesting questions to be so very cool, very interesting and sweet. And so, right, so a lot much. of people ask, how are they going to get 200 hours in before the retreat? Because 200 hours sounds like an enormous, it sounds like a lifetime of hours, let's be honest. Yeah. when you sign up for a YTTC and people think, how will I get that done? Amazingly, amazingly swiftly, actually, you can do it quite quickly. Um, you know, it just, it just requires a little bit of routine and a little bit of, a little bit of dedication, but 200 hours sounds like a lot, but it's actually an international minimum for many trainings around the world, um, whether it's Pilates or hypnosis or, there's many modalities that 200 hours seems to be like the minimum standard for a lot of things. And I don't believe that 200 hours is more than enough um, for most of us, because I mean, how much information is there? And yet somehow we do manage, we manage to be able to walk out after 200 hours and become wonderful teachers. And we've seen it over and over and over again, because when you're ready, you're ready. When you're ready to teach, you're ready. It's in your heart. So the rest is just acquiring the vocabulary. Um, so half of the half of that 200 hours is in the the lectures, the videos. 
And for those of you who are watching this now, I'm currently in the process of, re, of redoing a lot of the videos. And so you will all get additional video content and it's gonna be fresh and it's gonna be crisp and a lot more condensed and a lot more concise. Um, and I'm adding new, 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 new juicy stuff in there that you can always go back to for those of you who already are like way past module one. Um, but you know, as, the, as, as I grow as a teacher and the course grows, it evolves. It must never be static. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so half of that is done in the lecture times, Trish. And that can easily be done in two months. It was originally done in two months. Module one and module two were done in two months, only on weekends. That was it, it was just weekends. Three weekends, break, three weekends, break, and it was done. So then the other 100 hours is actually the full retreat. Can you believe it? A whole 100 hours is that retreat. So that is from five in the morning up until nine o'clock at night for seven days. It's like, poof, it's huge. And then you still go home and you've still got a few research assignments and things like that to do that just add in and compile a little bit more. And some people are nervous about that 50 hour log sheet, but 14 of those hours are signed off on your retreat. You do a minimum of 14 yoga classes on that retreat. So it's actually very, very doable. Thanks, Ra. And then I love that tea brought in Hinduism because obviously yoga has deep roots in Hinduism. But halfway through the course, what we've experienced, you and I, is often people that are brought up in a Christian religion or sometimes a very, very strict Christian religion start battling with it because they start getting a dilemma of, is this going against my religion or how is this going to work together? And, and we've seen it time and time again, right? And so I think for people that are brought up, brought up you know, in Hinduism, it's far easier than Christians sometimes to to integrate into their lives, which in retrospect shouldn't be difficult, but in reality is. I hear you, I hear you. And it's such a good question. You know, yoga as defined by Indian masters and gurus um, has never meant to be, when Yogananda taught of yoga, he said, this is not it comes from India and we must always honor its roots, but it belongs to the world. It belongs to humanity. And, and just like all the great mystical traditions, like Buddhism as well, the Dalai Lama says, Buddhism shouldn't make you a better Buddhist. It should make you a better Christian, a better Jew, a better Muslim. Um, so, so yoga is no substitute. It's not a bookmark for religion. And it's no substitute for religion. Your religion is your religion, okay? Your religion is what you believe it to be. Yoga is the science behind religion. <laughs> it, is, it is, religion tells you what, what, um, what does religion tell you? It tells you there is a God. Yoga tells you how to have a direct experience of God, whatever that is for you. So yoga isn't interested in telling you who God is and what you must believe about God, and why you must believe about God. It's not even interested in teaching you about reincarnation or anything. Those are Hindu and culturally appropriate topics to that region of the world. And many yogis take that on because they love it. But yoga itself, when you actually come right down to it, it doesn't speak about religion at all. It hardly even speaks about God, technically. It speaks about the soul, the individual soul and the cosmic soul. That's as far as it goes. And the rest of it is a step-by-step -step method on how to have direct experience of the divine, whatever that is for you. It just so happens that on our course, we fully, we fully want to share the beauty of the origins of it. And so I like to honor the roots of where yoga comes from. I don't want to whitewash yoga. I don't want to deprive it or deny it its origins. 
And so I feel in my heart, it's my responsibility to the motherland of yoga to teach that. But never is anybody ever expected to become a Hindu. Um, I'm not a Hindu at all, but I love the Hindu myths, the stories, and I deeply respect the religion and the culture. Um, Marianne has a question. Hi, um, is everything a little bit together? So I just wanted to add a little bit to that of the religion uh, because I've been talking a, a lot for some reason uh, with people and family about this religion thing. And from my point of view, for example, my religion is so, I am so sure of my religion that for me, it doesn't come in the way. You know what I'm saying? It's um, yoga, it's, it's like, um, uh, it's, it's, part of, it's part of my own journey, but I don't believe that yoga will change my religion. I mean, my religion is, I've got such a strong um, root, let's say. However, I am interested in many other uh, cultures and religions. So that's like for to say a little bit of my point of view and how I see it, you know, um, from a student point of view. It's like, you know, my, my, my faith and my, my culture, it's like, Inamovable. It's not. It's so strong. It's not. I can't change it. You know. What I'm so I'm happy with it. I'm happy with it. You know, um, Mar Marianne, just just to pause you there for a moment. It's so beautiful yes. because it's like yo learning yoga is like learning to be an artist. How the artist expresses him or herself is up to them. What the artist wishes to paint is up to them. How the artist wishes to paint God and nature and the world is up to them. Yoga is just giving you the pencil and the paintbrush and the colors and then saying, now you can go and paint on the canvas of your personal expression of the divine. I love how you worded that. Definitely. That's, that's beautiful, Marianne. That's absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. What, well, I, think, she, she I need more. to say something. So um, just quickly, quickly. Um, so that's from the religion thing. And then I just wanted to add like one of a question or maybe if we could go further into this because we've been on um, what is yoga means like the meaning theory then we went a little bit on the business side of it which I'm very like very nice as well and what like always comes to me as a question is how to like sort of I don't know if tricks of techniques for to gain more confident confidence um confident yes to for example redirect the class I'm uh, talking also about the labels. For example, you are giving a class and there is a very strong personality in the class. And I am very sure of myself, but as well, I can very fall into other people's opinion, like kind of very easily, not opinion, but how do you gain confidence for to like say to a student, no, I do have the knowledge. Obviously the certificate um, is gonna, is that's a proof that, oh, we did the course but how to like in the class get a little bit more confident. This is very personal. Um, that's what I would like to also like see how, how to gain confidence like in a class, how to redirect the class, for example. Mm -hmm. um, if someone says no, but I don't do that post like that because maybe sometimes I look a little bit weak. And so often I've got like very strong personality characters on my class. And I don't know, it's like, I feel like in the middle of a class, like, no, but we don't do things like that. And it's like, okay, it's my class and we're going to do this now. How, without <laughs> saying it, without being rude. That's <laughs> like, so, so, so Marianne, this is such a, it's such a cool question. Um, and it depends on the teacher. I know, I know yoga teachers who will turn around and say to that person, this is my class and you will do it this way. And if you don't like it, leave. Um, and, and that, oh, will no. very, that will very quickly put them in their place um, but I'm not I'm not that teacher and, uh, and I will I would simply turn around and say to the student go for it do it if, as long as it's not harming you do it whatever way you want to um, you know more love to you uh, but you know already we must understand that that person where are they coming from they're coming from that ego place um, so the more, the more they're coming out of the ego, the more opportunity there is for us as teachers to educate about that sort of thing. And, and I have had scenarios like this in a class where I've had students kind of pushing the boundaries and testing the limits. 
uh, or trying to show me up in a class. And at the end, during the Shavasana, I will speak about the ego. And everyone knows what's being done in that moment, but it's done very nicely and very humbly. And, uh, and I'm sure the person knows. But, you know, at that same time of, of looking for confidence, it really comes with practice. And, and you never need to be, you don't have to be the authority on anything, okay? The, or being an authority on something comes with time. But you're just there to guide people through an experience. And if people want to fight against you, that's their own stuff. That's their own mirror. That's their own things. And you can quite happily just say to them, thank you for sharing that and carry on teaching your class. Um, I've never really had much of that, to be honest with you. Uh, so so I, I wouldn't know. Trish, do you have a, an insight? I, I um, understand exactly where you're coming from, Marianne, and I think it's a difficult one. I think that, well, in fact, I don't think I know, I'm quite sure by the time you qualify and you completed your entire course and you have your certificate, you will never, ever duck ask that question again or doubt it because you will know inside you the teacher that you are and that's the beauty of this course is that it gives you the whole right to the end by the time you complete it you know you just know you just have an internal knowing of how you will handle it and what you'll do and it'll come to you without even thinking about it and I think that's the beauty of it and I think that's why it's so important to do the entire course you know, sometimes people will get into module one and feel like, I know this, I can teach. <laughs> and what they don't realize is that as much as they think they can teach, they really need to do the entire journey to understand and know that you can teach. And I think there's a big difference. Right. There is, because in, in that third module, by the time you go on to the third module, your theory is done. You don't learn more theory on the third module. But then, that's why I only put module one and two online. I, I refuse to put the whole course online, because there has to be at least half where I have pure hands-on contact with a student, my student, you. I have to know, is this person ready to go and teach? Are they equipped enough? Are they confident enough? Do they know their stuff? I will not endorse a teacher who's not ready to teach. And so that's why the whole course doesn't go online because I need that personal contact. By the time you leave that retreat, you are so confident in yourself and your abilities. And we've done it all through play, all through laughter, all through experience, all through joy, all through teaching, 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 teaching. You're gonna teach so much that by the time you leave that retreat, you'll feel like you've been teaching for 10 years um, and nobody will ever tell you what to do. And I've created scenarios on that retreat where you teach and the other students are actually, and I'm giving insight secrets now, they're actually trying to irritate you during the class and you learning techniques to override that and calm that. We've got a children's class that you guys are going to teach. And the and rest of you guys- good actors. Hey, yeah, Ma, we have very yeah. good actors that we bring on retreats. <laughs> and the rest of the students have to pretend to be kids and they've got to be jumping around and trying to irritate you. And by the time you, you finish that retreat, you'll be able to deal with anything. Imaginary old men who want to, who want to flirt with you, uh, whatever it is, we've got it all covered. So you will be so confident by the time you leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no Marianne it's it's good and you know what at the beginning in any career in anything whether you're an accountant and a yoga teacher a doctor whatever you are there's always this thing called the imposter syndrome at the beginning you know where you feel like you're just not good enough to live up to that title and that just comes with practice and time and then you will feel absolutely absolutely in alignment good nice question <laughs> Larisha, you joining us soon, aren't you? We missing you. Yes, yes. <laughs> I just hope I can get there, but I'm sure. And I hope COVID will calm down a bit because so so many people have COVID now. So I don't know. I hope I hope it will be calm. Oh, we'll, we'll, we hope so. It'll be amazing. It'll be awesome. But just going back to one last thing, right? Mm. 
that was brought up earlier on, and I think Marianne brought it up. What I love about yoga and meditation and mindfulness is, and I love this sort of, I don't know who told it to me, but when you pray, you talk to God. And so that's all we ever taught in life is to pray to God. And we do, we pray and we pray and we pray, but we never listen to God. And so yoga gives us, and meditation gives us a beautiful channel to actually listen to our inner wisdom and God and everything else, because it gives us a gap to just be and to listen and to live. So Trish, I just, came up, I, just, I just came up with an answer to your question about religion. I just came up with a, a phrase yeah. that we all use yeah. now. I just thought of it and it sounds great. Yeah. Re yeah. Your, re your religion teaches you how to talk to God. Yoga teaches you how to listen. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. I love it, love it. Because religion is very good at telling you how, how to ask for things, right? <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what we do. We go to our religious institutions and we start... Dear name of God, help me. This is what I need. And then we rattle off our shopping list. And God is just a glorified grocer, um, dishing, packing our bag and, and, and shipping it up to us. But what the mystical traditions are trying to do is actually to say, you know what? Prayer is great. And we must always be sending out rockets of desire. But what is more important is listening to how to get those prayers to manifest how to actually hear the guidance doesn't help if we just ask, 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 ask. If we stop at a petrol station and ask for directions and then we just drive off and ask for directions <laughs> and drive off, we're never going to hear the direction. So that's a lovely thing that you said, Trish. Yeah. We can all use that little gem. Yeah. So who else has any more questions? Octavia, are you still there? Because I know you're thinking about doing the yoga teacher training course. Are you there, Octavia? Hi, Trish. Yes, I am. <laughs> I yeah, actually wrote, yes, I actually wrote now that you've addressed my very dear subject of um, connecting to the Lord. Hey, You've answered by saying, I, I've, I've written here, talk to God and listen to God guiding your inner wisdom, hashtag alignment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love. <laughs> beautiful. You know, that is Octavia, beautiful. Octavia the, the tools that yoga, that yoga gives us, like the physical postures, for example, or the, the breath, the, the body is not ruled by any culture or any religion. The breath is not owned by any culture or religion. And God isn't owned by any culture or religion. And so we all, as a human, as a human race, we are, we are so blessed to be able to have all of these beautiful gifts of, of the teachings of our religions and our spiritual paths. And yoga must never be a substitute for, for your background, your culture, or your religion. It is there to give us a richer experience mm -hmm. and a personal experience that is completely between you and God. In fact, one of the very, very first limbs of yoga says that in order to be a yogi, we must have Ishvara Pranidhana, the connection with the Supreme Divine. It doesn't say who that is, just as long as we have connection with the Supreme Divine. Beautiful. Our creator. Our creator. Our creator. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, for, thanks, Octavia. I, lo I love what you said. That's really beautiful. Um, Zanita, I know you quite early on your course. Are you here? Do you have any questions that you'd like to ask on this journey that you're on? No. I think... It's fun. Does anybody else have any more questions? Larisha? Just one question, if I may ask it now. Where, where will the retreat be? Just for interest, or which area? Or It's in Stanford, in the Western oh. Cape. 
um, at a retreat center. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't know, this video might play later for some people. So in for November 2021 and February 2022, it will be at Hearth and Soul Retreat Center. Um, we've run many trainings there over the years and it is fully equipped with everything that we need to be relaxed, comfortable, safe, well-fed, warm, cool, calm and collected. <laughs> it becomes like a second home. You literally make your spot when you arrive and you leave it there. I love that area. It yeah. will be beautiful. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I always say that the, 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 the teachers on retreat become like little hamsters because their mat gets surrounded with cushions and pillows and blankets and it's like fluff everywhere. And it piles <laughs> higher and higher over the week. It's very cute. Um, so it's, I'm sorry, guys. Anita, yeah, just but my my sound wasn't wasn't good. I was not yeah. unmuted. I just want two things. So, um, what is the latest that we can let you know um, if we're going to join you at um, Stanford? That's my one question. And then a very uh, a different question is. Ryan, help me out. My greatest fear is how to keep time when you actually teach. How on earth do you do that timing thing in your in your head while you actually teaching um, asadas as well? You know, to keep time. How do you do the, the keep time thing? Yeah, great. Okay, Trish, you answer the first question. I'll answer the first. Yes. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Anita. Lovely to hear your voice. So it it is dependent on numbers because Ryan and I like to keep our model three numbers, you know, we like to have it very intimate and very personal. So we'll both be there. And the biggest group we'd have is probably 12 people on a retreat. So it's really number dependent, Zanita, as to when you book, because we don't believe, or we don't think that it's beneficial to anyone to go on a retreat with 30 or 40 people to become a yoga teacher because it's you know it's a it's a personal journey and everybody needs attention so we really really focus on keeping it very small and very intimate so there isn't a time limit it's more of a, a cutoff of numbers Zanita if that makes any sense to you okay thanks Trish that's perfect and say you missed this one I just have um oh um my mom had a stroke so i don't really know what's you know what is in what's what's you know will happen in future so if if i can't make this one for instance um when will there be a next one so so the next one's in february and we have had one or two occasions where people have booked and haven't been able to make a retreat and we, there's no extra expense and we just transfer that retreat over to the following one. We fully, fully understandable on that. There's not a problem with that. And then obviously, if our retreats are full, there is sometimes that someone may cancel. And if you book late, you may get that spot. So it can kind of work both ways, but we, we always very, very flexible. We want to really try and make it work as much as possible for you, Sunita. Yeah. Okay, Trish, thanks for that. Perfect, thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah. If and I'll hand over to Ryan, sorry. If ever you guys have questions about housekeeping and these kinds of logistics, Trish is the best person to ask for that. Um, I'm the guy who wears the turban, so I will give you information on headstands, handstands, and breathing techniques. Trish will help with uh, all the other important things that's not my skill set. So just contact her directly and she'll, she'll help you. Look, between the two of us, we just love like one team, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are yin and yang, ebony and ivory, yeah. <laughs> sunny and sure. Exactly, um, <laughs> we, anything you want us to be. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. All right. <laughs> All right, so to close off with your last question, Zanita, um, a lot of a lot of a lot of what you asked there with regards to the timing is going to be done on the retreat because that will that that kind of that practical element is what we focus on in retreat everything from your tone of voice to how you pace to how you manage to hold space in a class to the tools needed to hold a class like tissues or essential oils or clocks or props and all of these all of the practical elements are done there. 
and uh, we practice all sorts of different things. But, you know, roughly, um, and, and I also show you how to pace the clock for a 90 minutes or a 60 minutes. So for the first 15 minutes of a class, you should be really focusing um, on your, your intro, setting out what is my theme for today's class and warm ups. And then the last 10, 10 to 15 minutes um, is, is focusing on the cool downs, the shavasana, and the integration of those themes, or maybe a meditation or a pranayama. And so your, the main body of your class should be between 30 minutes and 45 minutes, somewhere around there. And in that 30 to 45 minute space, you really can play. So you can, if you're doing a slower paced class, you could be holding postures for three to five minutes. Um, if you're doing vinyasa, you could be moving more swiftly through them. There really is no rule, but always do what you do for a reason. So, you know, and, and I prefer to actually nowadays in my classes um, have less poses and focus more on building my students up into those less poses. So maybe I end up only having 10 to 12 postures in a class, but I've taken my time to build them into those poses slowly. In when I was 21, I just would cram the whole Ishta Asana manual into one class every time. And the, my poor students were so burnt out and exhausted, but they loved it. They always came back. I don't know why. Um, but, you know, I, I just like wanted lots of postures in. And that's one thing most teachers do at the beginning. They cram their sequence full of poses. And then, and then I, I always say, you know, it's okay to kind of downscale because you can always, if you get to the end of your sequence and you go, oh, shucks, there's still 20 minutes left or 15 minutes left, you can just repeat the whole sequence again. And no one will ever judge you for that. You'll say, okay, well done. Now that we've done the sequence once and you know what it looks like, we're going to do it again. And now we're going to go a little bit deeper and we're going to hold it a little bit longer. So you can do that, absolutely. And I'm gonna teach you all of these tricks on the retreat and how to work and feel really comfortable. And there's a strange thing that happens inside the body of a teacher. The moment you've been teaching for a period of time, my body knows when an hour is up. My body, my, my, I don't even need a clock. I can tell when it's time to bring everybody down to Shavasana and I can, but almost to the minute, get people finished with their class in an hour. There's, an, there's a, it's like muscle memory at play. So, but at the beginning, you just have a little clock with you and you just keep on, keep an eye on that clock and uh, easy peasy. All right, I'm gonna teach you all of that on our retreat together. Jenny, are you coming on retreat? Eventually, right? <laughs> Great. Great. Yes, that'll be good. When you've been on a couple, you just need to come on the final YTTC one. I'm the difficult client on the retreat. <laughs> no, I can guarantee you, you're not. <laughs> I can write story for you. I can guarantee you, you're not. No, 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 no. You're a dream. All right, guys. Thank you. We went nine minutes over time. Thank you for your patience. And for, um, for this, it's quite a nice session to have. Um, two weeks from now, I will be traveling, but I will have my laptop. And so I will be sending you a video from rural Mpumalanga, but I will be there. Okay, I might have a whole lot of chaos here behind me, but I will be there. So see you in two weeks. Stay We're looking blessed. forward to seeing you there, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay blessed and take care, everybody. Bye. Have a beautiful day. Good night, everybody.